All right. Uh, okay. Yeah, Tom. Okay, so um, I don't know how I drew the free will straw. Um, anybody got an idea what free will is? Right? Yeah. You give them stuff that you don't need. Oh, that's goodwill. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like that you jumped right in. That's great. Um, that is I thought awesome. you knew what she was talking about. No, I totally knew what she was meant. So, um, do you all feel like you get to make choices in life? No. No, I know, right? Like, so, so it's a really interesting question. That's actually really fascinating because at your age, you may feel like you don't get to make a lot of choices. But my guess is you get to make some choices, like how you treat your siblings. No, you don't make sure it just happens. Just you just wake up in the morning, you're just like a wind up doll. Okay, that's fair. If you think that, that's okay. That's one way to believe. Presbyterians are across the street. <laughs> keep working at it. Um, theologically, the word theology, theology means the study of God. Theology, theo God, ology study, study of God. Theologically. There are two camps in history about how we think about free will. There are folks that believe that we don't have free will, that we are predestined to live the life that we live, and that God has made that path for us, and that we will live it, and we live it out, and that's what it looks like. That is not historically what Methodists believe. Historically, Methodists come from a branch of Christianity called Armenian, and what they believe is that we have a choice, that humans have choices to choose good things and choose bad things and choose to help people and choose to not help people. And we choose to be nice sometimes and sometimes we choose to be mean. And sometimes we choose to do the best thing that we possibly do and it doesn't work. And sometimes we choose to do um, that which is really hard and it does work and all of that in between. And the truth of the matter is, is that we don't really exactly know which one's right. Anybody that wants to talk to you about free will and be honest will say that. But the thing that I like to do and that I hold on to is that if we think in free will is this like huge thing, we have all these choices to make, even at a time in life when we don't feel like we have a lot of choices because we're kids and they're like, we're going to get up and go to school. We don't have a choice about that. We got to eat what mom and dad prepared. Real free will is each day and each moment you have little choices that you get to make. And that's true for all of us. It's true for all the adults in the room. It's true for uh, all of you as confirmands. Is that life isn't one big choice. Life is a bunch of really small choices that we make each and every day. And that's how our life is shaped. And so I want to talk about how we make choices because I think that's the way we talk about free will. Because I don't think, I don't know. Do you all want to have a debate about whether or not free will exists or not tonight? Like, I just don't, I don't think that's helpful for us. I don't think it's helpful for me. So here's how we're going to do it. We're going to pray. And then I'm thinking we do three groups, Anne. So a, a group on Zoom and two groups in here. Does that make sense to everybody? Seem okay? Um, you all have been working together, so you kind of know how the groups might, might form better than me. So, and you can kind of help me do that. Yeah. But we're going to talk through, um, I have a mentor of mine that's been a mentor for me for about 10 or 12 years. Her name is Elaine Heath. And Elaine talks about what she calls the contemplative stance, which is not a word that's important for you all to remember. But what I have found about it is that it's a helpful way to think about how I make choices. And it's a four part movement. We show up, pay attention, cooperate with God, and release the outcome. And so tonight we're going to talk about those four movements, and that's what we're going to do tonight. And I want you to think about them through the lens, through the think about them as how you approach each day of your life. How you act to school, how you act to your parents, how do you act to your siblings, how do you act to your neighbors? How do we live each day? Sound good? Make sense? Seem okay? Maybe. Potentially. 
you're here, which may or may not have been a choice. <laughs> but you do have a choice in how you participate tonight and how you think about how this applies to your life. And as someone who, um, like all of you, has to make lots of choices day in and day out, I will say that it is helping for what it does for you. So, how about we pray? I'm going to share a poem that's been important to me, and then we'll start talking about each of the movements. You okay? And with any luck, we'll be done by like 15 after six. Yeah. All right, let's pray. God, we thank you for today. We thank you for your love for us. Thank you for the way you guide us and keep us. Help us to pay attention to the world around us. Pay attention to you and how we make choices. And recognize that each choice that we make affects us and others. May each of our choices be a choice made in love. A choice made to be more like Christ. We pray this in Jesus' name by the power of the Spirit. Amen. So there's this great little book written by this guy named John McKiston. John McKiston is a Methodist. He's a lay person and he's a lawyer. And John McKiston had been a part of the Methodist church for years and basically, um, I don't know, kind of walked away from his faith. It just wasn't important to him anymore. And he started reading this book called The Rule of Life, written by a guy named St. Benedict. And then he rewrote it in his own words. And I just want to read this poem because it's one that I think of probably daily. And it's called Each Day. He says, at the beginning of each day, as we open our eyes to receive the light of that day, as we listen to the voices and the sounds that surround us, we must resolve to treat each hour as the rarest of gifts and be grateful for the consciousness that allows us to experience it, recalling and thinks that our awareness is a present we know not where or how or why. When we rise from sleep, let us rise for the joy of the true work, the true work that we will be about this day and considerately cheer one another on. Life always provides matters for concern. Each day, however, brings with it reasons for joy. Every day carries the potential to bring the experience of heaven. Have the courage to expect good from it. Be gentle with this life and use the light of life to live fully in your time. Each day we have a choice of how we're gonna live, what we're gonna do, how we're gonna act. All right, so how do we make choices? Elaine, my friend, says that the first part of how we make choices is how we show up. So what does the word show up mean? What do I mean when I say that? To be there. On time, maybe? On time is part of it, yeah. To show up on the computer or here. Yeah, either way. Yeah, oh yeah, however you can get here. What else about showing up? Attitude. Attitude, your attitude, that's important. How you pay attention. What about our, talk about our senses, like, well, what are all the senses that we have available to us? Lots. Yeah, lots. But what are I talking about? Them? No, you can hear something, you can listen. Yeah. Vestibular sense. Do what? Vestibular sense. Vestibular sense. Explain it. It, it makes sure you can balance. Yeah, you can balance. Okay, that's interesting. Oh, I thought you meant like senses. <laughs> what are the senses? Smell, hearing, sight, touch. Touch, taste. taste. I always show up when you taste. <laughs> yeah, smell, <laughs> smell. What about like, all right, so have y'all ever been somewhere and been thinking about something else? Like right now, what are you thinking about? Food. Food. <laughs> I'm thinking about nothing. Thinking about thinking. What are you thinking about? Literally nothing. Nothing, <laughs> nothing. You're thinking about nothing. So part of showing up, Part of showing up is recognizing all the other things going on in your mind. So part of making a choice, part of making a decision, part of being human is how we show up. Part of showing up 
is recognizing all the ways that we have to be distracted when we're in any moment. So whether we're at school or at home, there's always stuff going on in our minds, there's always stuff going on around us, but we're also where we are. We're right here, right now. When you're in a moment making a decision, you're there. Um, and showing up is being fully present. You know that, what I mean by that? What's fully present mean? There, just there. What else? Well, you could be sitting here, but you're asleep in the chair. Yeah. <laughs> but they give us a whole speech about what we're thinking about, what we're thinking about. Say it again. Like you could give us like a whole speech, but then we don't even listen. We're just thinking about what we're going to do. Like, yeah, yeah. Like, think about what you're going to do tonight. Think about school tomorrow. The word engage. Mm. Being engaged with what's happening just so much. All right, so the first part, and, then, and, I, and I hope you remember this. this is, so the first part of this practice is to show up. And the second part is to pay attention. So, so talk to me about paying attention. Listening. What's paying attention mean? Like, like, um, you're like, so. Yeah, that's part of it. Absolutely. Oh, I'm sorry. Like, we could do this thing to you, like, looking at you, like, look at your thing, looking at you. Someone out there. Yeah. And take a moment to that. Yeah, so actually, like, fully being engaged, like Ann was saying, like, paying attention. The other thing about paying attention that's interesting is that. Um, when you're in a situation, when you're either in a place like this or when you're living out your life day in and day out, part of paying attention is recognizing there's a lot going on around you. There's a lot going on in every situation that uh, each of us bring uh, our wants, needs, desires, hopes, our feelings to anything that's going on. So when we're, when we're working with, when we're living with, when we're um, folks in our families or school paying attention is sometimes understanding and recognizing how other people are feeling. Uh, paying attention is recognizing how what we're doing and how we're acting is affecting other people. Uh, part of paying attention is both noticing and listening, but it's also recognizing that which is around you and that which uh, may affect how you make a decision or don't make a decision. So here's what I want you to start with. Here. I want you to talk about these first two movements, showing up and paying attention. And I want you to do two things. First, can you agree? I want you to talk about, talk about a time, think of a story or a time where you feel like you really showed up to a situation, whether it be at school or your family, an experience. It could be fun. It could have been hard. But where you really showed up, you were there, fully present, all the way engaged. And how you paid attention. So I want you to talk about a good example of that. How you really felt like you were showing up and paying attention. And then I want you to talk about maybe a time where you didn't show up and pay attention so well. <laughs> where it was really hard for you for whatever reason. And then I want you to talk about why there's a difference in the two. Does that make sense? Yeah. So show up, pay attention. An example of a time where you really did it and you, it was just awesome. An example of a time, and maybe not everybody might not share an example. You may not have an example from all of them. A time where it was really hard to show up and pay attention, and then why the difference? You'll have about seven to ten minutes. Sound good? Yeah. All right. So, how did how did how did how did Philip talk about? How did how did how did it go? Make sense? Show up, pay attention? Yeah. All right. We're, we're halfway through the, the four parts that I want to talk about tonight. So, have y'all talked about God at all in confirmation so far? Yeah, no? So, yeah. yeah. Maybe? Definitely in the prayer lesson a few weeks ago. So, um, if you were to describe. Yeah, you're not being present. <laughs> So if you were to describe <laughs> God's attributes, what God is like, 
What word would you use? What, what's God like? Kind. Kind. It's just kind of holy. Holy. God. God. Any other words? Describe God? Big. Big. Yeah. What did Rob said in the sermon this morning? You, you can follow the rope to the very end and you keep going. There's no end to the rope. Hmm? What an endless rope. Yeah, endless rope. Just top, continuous, infinite. Maybe one more squirrel. But what else? Are the, what are the words described about it? I think the word love. Uh, I think the word uh, relationship. Uh, I think the word sacrifice. Uh, humility. Um, and we're generous. So caring, caring, creative, creative, imaginative. I think there's a lot of that. Hmm. All right. So, so part of the discussion around free will that's happened in the church forever has to do with how much God knows about us and how much God. Um, Knows about how we live and that kind of thing. So, in order to have a little discussion about that, I want for you all to read in your groups Psalm 139, verses 1 through 12. So, if you read Psalm 139, verses 1 through 12, and if you get 1 through 139, 1 through 12, and what I want you to do. Is we're going to practice. Have y'all heard of the practice Lectio Divina? Anybody? We did that with Jim. Perfect. For Grace. You, you were, uh, Pastor Jim, you did Lectio Divina? I don't know how you did it. There's lots of different ways. But I want you to read the passage twice. I want you to read it once and then be silent for like 30 seconds to a minute and just think about what you heard and then read it a second time. Does that sound good? And just do your groups. Like, y'all can just do it. You want us to read it out loud? Or? No, no, read it out loud. Read it out loud and then take about 30 seconds to a minute and then read it out loud again. One through 12. One through 12. Um, all right, so when you think about just, the, just you don't have to like, just share a few thoughts. So when you read the song, what did we learn about God and what did we learn about humans? Any thoughts that came to mind that y'all shared in your groups? What do we learn about God? We all said that God is in everything, a part of everything, knows what we're doing all the time. That's a part of everything, yeah. God is a stalker of life. God is a stalker of life. Yeah, I'm saying. All knowing. All knowing. <laughs> what about humans? God is smarter. Yeah, we, we talked about, you know, when you come and you get to choose. This path or this path, he's all knowing. What does that mean? And could he be all knowing and you still get to choose, um, you know, which way you're going to go? Yeah. And what does that mean? <laughs> yes. That's why I started this whole thing. So that anyone that can tell you and says, this is exactly what free will or predestination means, they're lying. They don't know. We're trying to figure out together. That's part of the process. It's a good thing. So, all right. So we, we feel like we got a handle on showing up and paying attention. Show up, pay attention. Go kind of get you know basic idea what that means day in and day out. All right. So there's this third piece of this process that's called participating with God. Can you all think of ways that you see God working in the world? I'm gonna ask the Max. Carolina, I, <laughs> <laughs> I think the fact that Carolina and you fans can still be friends today. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, yeah, I'm All right, where do we see God working in the world? I think it's springs in nature. Yeah, and all the flowers and the yeah. trees that make us sneeze and that kind of thing, but they're beautiful. <laughs> right. What else? 
I think about um, all the ways that people around the world are responding to the, the war that's going on in Ukraine, whether it's um, people sending supplies or folks taking refugees, or I think that's the way that we see God working in the world in the midst of something that's really bad. What are the ways we see God? What about like, we think about Haywood Street congregations, there's you know, a thousand people a week eating meals down there together. Um, that's a huge way we see God work in the world. Or I think about uh, congregations for children, C for C. Next weekend, we're going to be collecting uh, food. Jack, you got your hand up? Um, I see God as like the energy. Yeah, yeah. energy. You know, the, the word that we might use that is the spirit working through everything, but the energy, I like that. That's good. What else? What other ways do you see God work in the world? Oh, yeah. What about just when someone's nice to somebody else? Someone gives you, you, you smile at somebody just to be kind. Uh, you give a family member a hug when they're feeling down. You, uh, yeah, give them. I kind of see it during, like, you know, when you're, when you own a black car and all of a sudden it makes it a light. Like a very dark yellow with all the palms on it. I love I feel like wow, that's a lot of flowers. <laughs> it's a lot of flowers. It's a, it's a lot of representing God in the world. What about like does it have to be a big thing or can it be small things? Or both? It has to be big. I think I would say maybe both, but okay, I like big. So the third part of this movement, the third part of this way that we think about choices and how we live our lives is that we show up and then we pay attention and then that we recognize that God is at work in the world in lots of different ways, uh, through energy, through uh, the spring, the, the flowers, and the blooming, and the, the beauty of our earth through how we treat each other and how we care for one another. And part of our call as people that follow God is to find ways to participate and be a part of that. You know what I mean by participate? To be a part of something, to do it, to try it, to be how we live. So if free will is a thing, and if we have choices, which I think we do, then each day we have a choice to determine whether or not we're going to participate for good and to share God's love and to be like Christ or to be something less than that. Does that make sense to everybody? You have lots of choices in life. And, and again, I go back to what I said from the beginning. There are big choices in life. Are you going to get married? Who are you going to marry to? Do you go to college? Where do you go to college? What kind of job do you get? You know, how she buy it? There's big choices. But the biggest choices are the choices that we make that we think of that are little ones day in and day out and make of who we are and how we live. And how we show up for those choices, how we pay attention to what's going on in those choices, and how we recognize and hope and believe and then try to be a part of us the way God is working in those choices. Is a huge part of who we are. So we show up, we pay attention, we recognize that God's at work in the world and seek to participate with God in the world in the way God loves and cares for and is a part of people's lives in a way that gives grace and humility. And then the last part of the movement, the last thing we uh, will talk about tonight, is this process of releasing the outcome. Now that just sounds really strange, doesn't it? Release the outcome. What does that mean? Here's what it means. So often in life, we try to find either things or actions for ourselves to be God. I try to be God, you try to be God, we all try to be God from time to time. We can't be God, and we're not God. And part of releasing the outcome is recognizing that every time we show up and every time we pay attention, and every time we participate, that's our part. And then we release the outcome. How somebody responds, we can't control. We can't always control the outcome or what happens. The truth is that sometimes we try to do something really good and it just turns out kind of sideways, y'all. It's a part of life. It's, it's sad and it's hard and it's difficult. 
And I would argue that if we participate, if we show up and pay attention and seek to participate with God, even when the outcome is released, there's opportunity for a resurrection, there's opportunity for healing, there's opportunity for wholeness, there's opportunity for us to learn in the situation. So, from the beginning, is there free will? Maybe. I think so. Wesleyans think so. People that follow John Wesley, both those of us that are Methodists, we think so. Because we believe that we serve a God in Jesus that wasn't just a automaton, you know? Jesus wasn't a wind-up doll that was turned on the back and just kind of went through life and figured, no, Jesus had choices. It's like we had choices. And Jesus chose over and over and over again to participate in love of God and love of neighbor. And each day when we show up and pay attention and cooperate with God, we have the opportunity to participate in that too. So I know this is a really, I, I don't know why I told you I would talk about this. <laughs> this is such a big idea. It's very complicated. And I would argue incredibly simple because it's not about a big choice, but it's about every little choice we have to make in front of us and taking that seriously and recognizing that it affects both us and other people. And we have choice and agency in that. What I mean by agency is that you get to participate. You get to do a part. So I want to close you're right at 6 30. That's what you said, right? Yeah. yeah. Holden had a question about luck. About luck. So what where does luck come into play? Well, speaking of the Tar Hill Duke game. <laughs> <laughs> so luck is, luck's an interesting thing. You know, I, I don't um I I think that luck happens and we get blood there are blessings. I mean, one way to talk about that in a in a Christian context is that rather than talking about it being luck, is that there are blessings in life that we didn't anticipate. Um, as far as like luck, we talk about like a lottery system or that kind of thing. I don't know. There's, that's, math, that's mathematical. And it feels like luck at the time. But I think sometimes like, I don't know, in my life when I said, man, I felt lucky. When I've reflected on it later and come back to it, I've recognized that that was a blessing. And that there was someone involved, there was someone, a person, but also someone in God involved in that blessing. And I think that's really important to recognize is that, um, that at the time it might feel like luck. And I think that it does feel like that a lot of times. My, my personal experience has been that when I've reflected on that later, it's felt more like a blessing. Yeah. I think it's a great question. Uh, I'm going to end this last quote, and then I'll go. I, I'm going to got like five minutes or so. Any questions you all would have ever wanted to potentially ask a pastor, I'll answer. <laughs> or said I don't know, which may be the answer. So Rob uses this great quote from this uh, poem called "The Hound of Heaven." It's by named Francis Thompson, and it's really interesting because the quote was actually found on like a sugar packet in his pocket after what? he passed away. And he had had such a hard life, and it, he, it wasn't clear that he knew that God cared for him, but he, he, he read, wrote this. He said, I fled him down the nights and down the days. I fled him down the arches of the years. I fled him down the labyrinth ways of my own mind. And in the midst of tears, I hid from him. And what the point of this, and why I'm using this tonight, and why I'm ending with it, is that... Um, at times we can feel far away from God. We can feel that God's far away from us, that we don't understand what God is. Even folks like Mother Teresa and her uh, biography talked about how there were years that she felt over, separated from God. But one of the things that I think is true is that God continues to pursue us and wants to know us and wants to love us and wants us to share God's love in the world. And we'll even when we run away, even when we don't feel like God's present, God is, is like this hound who's just trying to find us. Uh, 
and trying to be a part of their lives and trying to shape who we are and how we live. In each and one of those, each one of those small decisions, choices that we make each day that determine who we are and how we live and how we treat others. So, yeah, that's all I got. Unless there are other questions. <laughs>